Now, obviously, anybody that wants to be a candidate has to buy this book. What I'm going to ask you is, what about the people that have no intention of running for office at all? What about the average person out there who wants to get active, wants to be a volunteer, wants to work for a candidate, just wants to do the, the envelope stuffing and the door knocking and the phone banking? Um, should they buy this book and what will they get out of it? Well, Barry, I wrote this book actually for the thousands of volunteers I've met on the campaign trail because people would come up to me and say, well, you're in politics, so this is in your political DNA, but what about the rest of us? What is the architecture of a campaign? How does it work? A lot of people are asked to vote or they're asked to write a check or, or nowadays to spam their friends with an internet petition. Mm -hmm. But how can people really make a difference? And so I thought if we took the knowledge from the, the candidate boot camps and put it in a book so that anybody who wants to run for office, whether you're running for President of the United States or President of the PTA or if you're working on a ballot initiative campaign or maybe just uh, working with your local community nonprofit and wanting to get to know your neighbors in an organized disciplined way mm -hmm. that's what campaign boot camp is all about I wrote it so it was a collective memoir of stories and leadership stories from the campaign trail focused largely on 2006 some of the successful campaigns we worked on last year but also with instructions after each chapter so it's a self-help book you can read it and then do the exercises yourself identify your own call to service work on your own personal management message money and mobilization plans in order to launch the kind of campaigns that you care about yeah, I want to repeat those because those are what you call the four metrics in the book that's right the, the, the four management, management message money and mobilization that's right and so those are the four M's, the pieces that you put together to run a successful campaign. You also break, break it down into seven steps. And I'm not going to pretend that I've memorized the seven steps. So I'm going to read them off this wonderful cheat card that you gave me. Uh, but I know some of them. But identify your call to service is number one. Number two, know your community. Number three, build your leadership teams. Four, define your message. Five, connect with people. Six, raise the money, seven, mobilize to win. Now, I've had some experience. I've run three losing campaigns. I ran in a, in a congressional primary that I lost by a hair. I ran in a congressional race that I lost by three points. And I ran in, in an assembly race in the primary that I won't even talk about. But those are the, those are the three. Um, so I'm going to ask you, as someone who's been through it three times, why wasn't raise the money first? Because... First and foremost, you have to identify your call to service. It's who you are, what you care about, what you're willing to spend your time, energy, reputation, money, time away from your family and mm -hmm. friends and other commitments, vacations. What are you really willing to do and not get credit for? That's your call to service. What are you willing to give up in order to make the world a better place? If you could change the world with a bold stroke... What would the world look like? And that vision, those ideas, those values, they, they are your call to service. For most people, they start when you're very, very small. They're part of family, community service sure. traditions and go on. But really when it comes down to it, what is the one thing that motivates you to help other people, even if you don't win that election exactly. and even if you don't get any credit for having tried? Yeah, I was being a little facetious with that question because obviously the call to service is the most important thing and and you have some wonderful call to services throughout the book um, from uh, from Nancy Pelosi as well as from uh, Fred Ross uh, Jr. Uh, uh, just people from unions people from nonprofits people from all walks of life and it's and it's quite wonderful to read those calls to service because they're very inspiring um, the reason I was being facetious however is that most politicians that I meet um, when they come to me to ask me for support, never talk about their call to service. They never tell me why I should support them, other than to say they can win. They uh, can put together the bankroll. They can put together the team. They have the top consultants. Um, you know, they. What I want to know when I have that kind of a conversation, a breakfast or a lunch or something with someone, is why you? 
I mean, that's what I think is the most important thing to, to be putting forward. And yet, so many politicians, even politicians, by the way, that have turned out to be great in office, seem to neglect that part. Now, do, you, do you notice that, and, and are you trying to change that through this book? Well, I am trying to change that through this book, and, and clearly those politicians haven't been through campaign boot camp. Mm -hmm. But the first question that any of our um, audience ought to ask somebody who comes to them for support is very clear. Do you want to do something? Or do you want to be something? Right. Right. Because there are two kinds of people. A lot of people want to be something. They like the publicity or the trappings or the name in lights, whatever it is. We're here in Southern California, and you certainly have a lot of that in show business. Mm -hmm. Are you a show horse or are you a workhorse? Oh, sure. Sure. And uh, there's a difference between having an image and having a vision. Mm -hmm. So do you want to do something? That is the first question to ask. And and the reason that I started campaign boot camp with that is because as you say Barry, so often it it is the call to service that 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 drives people forward, but either because they don't want to come off as being ambitious so they don't talk about it or they are not confident in their call to service, they haven't really thought it through. Right. I'll give you an example of that I my test for presidential candidates. I call it the NORAD test. Right. That, named after the North Atlantic Air Defense System. The seven minutes, yeah. Right, the yeah. seven minutes. On 9-11, uh, 2001, it took seven minutes from the time that their um, Northeast Air Defense System picked up a uh, threat to the United States and the time it took to scramble the jets off of Otis Air Force Base. So it's basically seven minutes from the time that the country is under attack to the time that our country can respond. Mm -hmm. During those seven minutes, mind you, that's the National Security Advisor gets the call, then calls Secretary of Defense, calls the President, and the President has to make up his or her mind. Sure. So it's a very brief seven minutes. And what is the judgment, leadership, and experience that goes into that seven minutes? And if my loved ones are on a plane, my loved ones are on the ground in a targeted city, mm -hmm. or I'm just watching from wherever I am, I want to know What's my president going to do, and why? What is the vision, idea, and values? What's the call to service of my president as my president makes that life or death decision, not only for the people implicated in the attack, but really for the course of the entire world? And so I, I put that in there because I think that's how we, ha we all have to look at, at these candidates who are running for president. What is their call to service? Do they want to be president, or do they want to do the job of commander-in-chief, which is to protect our country and to protect our civil liberties?